The Rwandan genocide was one of the most intense and atrocious campaigns of mass slaughter perpetrated in the 20th century. For over a hundred days, close to one million people were massacred. It was 1994. Patrick Shirangabo was just 12 years old. In the early morning, his father turned on the radio and heard music of mourning being played for the president. My father, uh, he told us to, to go away. He said, you know, you go. Uh, so we opened the door, me and my uncle and my mother. So we ran the, to, our next, uh, to another house that was uh, in process of was being built. In the morning, that's when my mom told me to go and see my father and see how what happened to him, how, how, how he do it. I hugged him and he said, yeah, you know, you can see what happened. So everything was done. They, they attacked him at night. And, and so I was asking him if we can make tea for him and things like that. And I saw, and then the noise went on again and he chased me away. You know, he kept saying, I don't, don't want to see you dying in my house, uh, in my eyes go, you know, so. Uh, yeah, yeah, my father was uh, the first one to be killed, and my uncle, he, he was killed, he was battered at the same time. Yeah, I was brought on the street, and, and my uncle was laying on, because they were placing people online, and he was laying there, and he was laid. Uh, you know, and he, this was open, so he was dead, and and I was told to, you know, today just uh, between him and the God. That's when they did what they had to do. And they thought I was dead, but I was alive, like, I was listening everything I could. I could think anything, so. And so when they went to bury us, it was too late at night, and, and they said they were tired, so they didn't put, they didn't want to, to cover the, the, bar, uh, the burial site. They said they would do it in the morning. That was a chance for me to to get out of this site. And the rest is a long story. The back of Patrick's head had been slashed open with a machete, along with his leg and arm. His mother hid him for the next 98 days in abandoned buildings. Patrick's life was shattered, leaving him deeply traumatized in the aftermath of the genocide. But you, you still had... You, you know, I had a feeling that, you know, no matter what happens, I be, you know, I belong in that barrier and that burial. I belong because those were the people knew the people we we lived together to the end. Because most of them were killed even in front of me, so I was the last one to see it, and then the last one to get out of it. So you you you, and and at the age of twelve, thirteen. Was in Asia. Five years later, Patrick arrived in Canada as a conventional refugee. The reality of, you know, of, of me and where I'm coming from was a different culture, different behavior, everything, language, everything was different. And when I arrived, he was was too far away from home, and and it was a different country, different ways of life. I could speak French, but I couldn't speak English. Patrick enrolled in a French high school where he was advised to enter the general non-academic program. When he graduated, he discovered that he had been misinformed about the requirements for university. He began night and correspondence courses and then heard about the University of Toronto's transitional year program. TYP is a university access program for adults who do not have the formal background to qualify for university admission. Patrick is a brilliant student. You know, he did extremely well in the program. He's gone on uh, to be an undergraduate in um, a new college at the University of Toronto, uh, and he's just doing uh, incredibly well. Now, a third-year student at the University of Toronto's Faculty of Arts and Science, Patrick is studying African and Aboriginal studies and political science. Everybody that's around Patrick ends up going back to school or, you know, feeling better about themselves. He's, um, he's well known in um, the Randis community at this university as a great 
uh, supports both emotionally and academically and as a, a great friend because now we're like families. He's the brother that I don't have here, you know. Two-thirds of the Rwandan community in Toronto are between the ages of 18 and 27. Most lost their families to the massacre. Patrick connects with other members, helping them deal with their loss and pain. He volunteers his time to teach language, culture, and dance to Rwandan children. In Patrick's native tongue, Ebutsa means those who know must tell. So, Patrick speaks at high schools, community centers, and colleges, and has been interviewed by the media many times. In 2004, he was one of the main organizers of a three-day event to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the genocide. He's someone one absolutely wants to celebrate for his achievements, for what he has done academically, for what he has done for many different communities. And he's just a, a really remarkable human being and you have to kind of remind yourself um, that he's still really young and has all of this extraordinary future ahead of him. Patrick's experience has taught him to live in the present and not to plan for the future. But he's pretty sure wherever life takes him, he'll be working with people, maybe even teaching. <laughs>